Hey everyone, I hope you guys are doing well and your foundation block is going smoothly. I know things can start piling up, especially when you've just started medical school and you're still learning how to study. So hopefully this peer assisted learning session can help you manage all the new material you're expected to learn. Before we get started, I'm just going to quickly introduce myself. Hi, I'm Senna. I'm a final year medical student and I will be reviewing this physiology lecture taught to you guys earlier this block by Dr. Abdul Jabbar. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I put my contact details on the slide. I've been a PALS tutor for a little over a year now, and my main focus is to just achieve one thing, and that is to provide you guys with the most high yield information on a given topic in the shortest amount of time. So without further ado, let's get started. These are the learning outcomes given to you um, by Dr. Abdul Jabbar for this lecture. Um, and because we will be talking about smooth muscles today, my recommendation is that you finish studying your lecture on skeletal muscles before studying this one, um, because there will be a few moments throughout the session where we compare and contrast the two, like right now. So this is how we're going to start. These are the three main types of muscular tissue responsible for movement within the human body. So we have a skeletal muscle, which is found attached to your bones, and it's responsible for the voluntary movement of bones and for walking around and all that good stuff. And essentially, these skeletal muscle fibers run in these parallel tracts called striations, and they're multinucleated, and they're made up of sarcomeres, and that's all we're going to say for today. Smooth muscles now, which is our focus for today, these fibers lack striations, which distinguish them from skeletal and cardiac muscle. The striations found in skeletal and cardiac muscles are created by the banding patterns of thick and thin filaments in the sarcomeres. In smooth muscles, there are no striations because the thick and thin filaments, while present, are not going to be organized in sarcomeres like they are for the other muscles. Um, smooth muscle is found in the lining of your internal organs, like your gastrointestinal tract, uterus, blood vessels, eyes, etc. And it controls the involuntary contractions of these muscles in, in these regions. And, and, they, and they fill out purposes like peristalsis and digestion and vasoconstriction of your blood vessels and pupil dilation. And they, they contract slowly and automatically, unlike striated muscles. So you're not paying attention to your body when it does these things. Your automatic, automatic, sorry, auto, autonomic nervous system is automatically controlling um, all of these different functions. And then really quickly, in comparison, cardiac muscle is found in the heart. It's responsible for the rhythmic contraction of the heart, aka your heartbeat. And cardiac muscle fibers are branching, they're intercalated, lightly striated, have a single nucleus per fiber, and are not the focus of today's lecture. So let's get back into smooth muscle cells. Um, just a few more details. Um, they're components of organs. They're not attached to them, such as skeletal muscles being attached to your bone. Uh, we don't have that with smooth muscles. They are basically a part of the organ, and that's how they uh, commit their function. And again, involuntary movements, we said peristalsis, vasoconstriction, pupil dilation, nursing examples. And smooth muscle cells don't actually depend on action potentials and don't actually require membrane depolarization to contract. They also have some types of pacemaker activity, which we'll get into later. They demonstrate slow, sustained contractions, and the way that calcium interacts with smooth muscle is a little bit different from skeletal muscle, but the bottom line is that Calcium is the trigger um, of a smooth muscle contraction as well as a skeletal muscle contraction. So to start, let's talk about the three ways we can categorize smooth muscle. This is just a copy-paste slide from Dr. Abdul Jabbar's lecture. Um, and the three ways are by location, by contraction pattern, and by smooth muscles communication with neighboring cells. So by location, um, again, I feel like we've already said this smooth muscle can be found in the walls of these different organs and systems like your GI tract, your bladder, respiratory tract, and eyes, and that's one way to classify smooth muscle cells. And then by contraction pattern, smooth muscle can be phasic, meaning it alternates between phases of contracted and relaxed states. 
or smooth muscle can be tonic, meaning it is kind of always contracted, it's continuously contracted, and we'll, we'll be giving you examples in, in a little bit for both of those things. Um, and then finally, the last way we categorize smooth muscle is by their communication with their neighboring other smooth muscle cells. So smooth muscles can either operate as a single unit, where cells are electrically connected to each other by gap junctions, and they contract as one coordinated unit, or they can be multi-unit, where each cell kind of functions independent of each other. And we'll get into that in a bit. But first, we're going to talk a little bit more about tonic and phasic contractions. So tonic and phasic smooth muscles are the two types of smooth muscles that differ in their contraction patterns. Let's start with A over here, phasic smooth muscles. So phasic smooth muscles alternates between phases of contracted and relaxed states. For example, in your esophagus. You don't want your esophagus to always be contracted because you won't be able to eat anything. It needs to contract during peristalsis when you're trying to push the food down, right? And as well in your intestines too. So it's this phasic control of the autonomic nervous system that your, your body does for you when you need to digest food. Now in comparison, we have tonic contractions. This is characterized by a continuous type of contraction and this is found in things like maybe your spinsters or your or your your arteries and your veins right so this type of contraction is more of a slow maintained isometric contraction and essentially think about it in terms of maybe a spinster you don't want your lower esophageal spinster to always be contracted because or you don't sorry you don't want it to always be open because then food will reflux from your stomach up and out and you could you know throw up like all the time so you want that to continuously be closed same thing with your your urinary and anal spinsters so these spinsters are meant to be closed to keep the contents of your body inside your body and they open when need be right um, so in summary tonic smooth muscles are continuously contracted and generate a slow maintained isometric contraction while phasic smooth muscles here on top um, alternate between contracted and relaxed states and they generate a transient contraction okay and both of these types of smooth muscles are regulated by different mechanisms and controlled by different branches of the nervous system now for the single and multi-unit smooth muscle cells on top we have the multi-unit and at the bottom we have single units so to start multi-unit cells are individual cells that do not have gap junctions these little branches over here are gap junctions in the single, so you can see here in the multi-unit we don't have them. Um, so they're not electrically coupled between cells. These gap junctions are not electrically coupling our cells. And these types of multi-unit smooth muscles are going to be found in the airways of your lungs, they're going to be found in your large arteries, and in the ciliary muscles of the eye. These cells are densely innervated, as you can see there's, there's a whole lot of um, innervation going on here and lots of axons next to every single cell um, and these muscles are basically working mainly under the control of the autonomic nervous system the main the main initiator of these types of muscles contractions is uh, neurogenic so we call these more so neurogenic type of smooth muscles whereas these single unit smooth muscles are going to be called something are going to be called myogenic, right? So single unit smooth muscle cells are going to be electrically connected by gap junctions and contract as one coordinated unit. And these are going to be found in the walls of your like hollow organs like your stomach and your bladder and your uterus and your intestines. And they're called myogenic because they can contract regularly without the input of a neuron. So they have kind of this this pacemaker cell ability where they can generate this rhythmic action potential because of this intrinsic electrical activity due to those gap junctions that they share. And most smooth muscles in your body are actually of this single unit um, cell type. So jumping into the structural side of things, let's, let's take a look at this diagram here. Smooth muscle does not contain sarcomeres, which are the organized contractile units 
that are found in both cardiac and skeletal muscle tissue, nor do they contain myofibrils, which are those rod-like structures made up of repeating segments of sarcomeres. So because smooth muscle lacks both of those things, it does not contain striations or that striped pattern that characterizes skeletal and cardiac muscles. And it's the only muscle tissue that does not contain those striations or stripes, and that's actually why we call it smooth muscle. Getting a little bit further into the microscopic structure of it, um, although smooth muscle does not contain those um, sarcomeres, it does contain those thick myosin filaments and those thin actin filaments found in both skeletal and cardiac muscle tissue that work to contract the muscle fiber via a sliding filament mechanism. And these are just kind of dispersed throughout the cytoplasm of the cell. Now, as you look at this illustration of a smooth muscle fiber, you'll notice the single nucleus in the center and there is a net-like structure running throughout the muscle fiber and the little dots in the side are called dense bodies and they attach to something called the sarcolemma which is a smooth muscle cell's outer sheath and they work similarly to the z-disc in um, the sarcomere aka in, in, in skeletal muscles and, and they're going to allow the thin filaments to attach to them and they really anchor um, down those thin um, filaments and so the dense bodies will do that, and then they also allow for the attachment of these intermediate filaments um, that add strength and stability to the structure. So smooth muscle contracts through the sliding filament mechanism just like skeletal and cardiac muscle. So when calcium ions go and they trigger um, the myosin phosphorylation to occur and the myosin and actin cross bridges to form, um, and pull these things together in the contraction to happen, it also is pulling, therefore, on the dense bodies since those thin filaments are attached to those dense bodies. And then, um, as well as the intermediate filaments, because the intermediate filaments are also attached to those dense bodies, and it results in the contraction of the entire smooth muscle fiber. So that's it for classifications. We're going to now jump into contraction. And these were about the equivalent of maybe four to five different slides, so I've just kind of compressed them into two. Um, a smooth muscle contraction and then a relaxation slide um, from your original lecture. So we're just going to be looking at this slide followed by this one right after it, and we're going to be using this image and then this image right after it, and then there's a little bit of a summary on each one, and it basically has just kind of taken all the, the very long fluffy wordiness of your lecture and just kind of compressed it into what you need to know. So essentially for a smooth muscle contraction, the most important thing that I think you guys need to know is that just like in a skeletal muscle contraction, calcium is what is going to trigger the contraction to happen. So calcium is going to be in the extracellular fluid, it's going to enter um, inside your cells, so now it's going to be in the cytosolic fluid, and then that calcium in the cytosol can bind to this protein called calmodulin, and then when it binds to calmodulin, it's going to form this complex called the calcium calmodulin complex, aka CAM, right? And so CAM has the ability to activate the myosin light chain kinase, which is this enzyme which can phosphorylate, aka add a phosphate group to your myosin light protein chain. And then your myosin light protein chain, once activated because it's been phosphorylated, can then go and activate myosin ATPase. So the myosin ATPase will essentially be what allows your actin to go and start forming those cross bridges in the smooth muscle cell and then allow contraction to begin. Right, and so it all starts with that calcium calmodulin complex. And in comparison to skeletal muscle, you don't have that calcium calmodulin complex. You'll you'll have troponin instead, right? But we don't have that here. It's 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 the CAM complex that is of utmost importance and activates this kinase. And um, it's it's better represented in this later slide over here. But uh, we'll get into this slide once we've also looked at relaxation. So going back real quick, the activated myosin ATPase, which we saw over here, which was activated um, by this light chain protein, can be inhibited by two proteins, 
that are not found in your skeletal muscle, and they're called caldesmin and calponin. So those are the two inhibitory proteins of myosin ATPase. Okay, um, and then one thing that was brought up is something called your latch stage, which is especially relevant in your tonic contractions because the importance of this latch mechanism is that it can maintain prolonged tonic contractions in smooth muscles for hours and hours with a little use of energy. So you don't need as much ATP and there's a little continued um, excitatory signal that is required from your nerve fibers or hormonal sources or whatever um, to allow the tonic contraction to happen. So it's because of this latch mechanism that you know a slower actin binding cross bridges um, system that allows for tonic contractions to take place without requiring as much ATP. So that's kind of a very important mechanism that we talk about when we talk about smooth muscle cells in comparison to uh, skeletal muscle cells. So the three main differences then would be the calmodulin, it would be the myosin light chain, it would be the latch stage, and then these as well would be the fourth. So for relaxation, it's just the exact opposite happening in all of these things that we've worked towards down here in activation is just going to be unactivated. And why it's going to be unactivated? Because calcium now is being removed from the cell. Once calcium is removed from the cell through these two um, mechanisms, then that decrease in that calcium is going to cause it to unbind from that calmodulin complex. Once it unbinds from that calmodulin complex, the myosin light chain kinase enzyme is also going to get inactivated. And then it's going to dephosphorylate or remove the phosphate group from the myosin, causing then that myosin ATPase activity to decrease, and therefore that muscle to relax. So we remember here that myosin light chain ATPase was what was allowing our actin to form the cross bridges in the beginning. Now when that ATPase ultimately, because of this whole sequence of things happening, is gone, that actin can't form those cross bridges and, and that's it. The contraction is over and therefore your muscle relaxes. So these are just kind of steps that you need to memorize. Um, honestly, I tend to memorize things by words. I find that images only confuse me more, but the images are here in case you guys need them. And essentially, this is what's going to help you answer a majority of, of questions um, that show up in the exam, inshallah. So to test your knowledge, let's go for a couple questions right now. You guys can pause the video at this moment, and you can see if you can answer this yourself. But in just a moment here, I'll be answering it um, in this video with you guys. So the question is, which characteristic or component is shared by skeletal muscle and smooth muscle? And if you answered C, elevation of intracellular calcium for excitation contraction coupling, then you're correct. Remember, we stress it uh, quite a bit over here that calcium is the main initiator for both skeletal and smooth muscle contractions. And then remember, we said troponin was replaced by calmodulin. Oh goodness, sorry. Um, and that thick and thin filaments are not going to be arranged in sarcomeres. That's why it's, it's not striated um, in smooth muscles. And then um, high degree of electrical coupling between cells. It, it varies because sometimes you have the multi-unit, sometimes you have the single unit. Spontaneous depolarization of the membrane potential does not happen here. Next question is, in contraction of gastrointestinal smooth muscle, which of the following events occurs after binding of calcium to calmodulin? So we can pause the video here. And just before you guys answer, I'm going to go really quickly back to the slides so you guys can check this out, specifically this sentence. And we'll go back and answer the correct um, answer is C, increase, I did it again, sorry, increase myosin light chain kinase. Okay. Okay, so for this slide, the first thing that we should probably do is just quickly review that 
the myosin light chain kinase, which is activated by the calcium calmodulin complex, is essentially responsible for the downstream of events that occur in order for the smooth muscle contraction to happen, right? And then the phosphatase, on the other hand, is responsible for removing that phosphate group that the kinase put onto the myosin light chain that is then responsible for the downstream of events that lead to relaxation of smooth muscles. So the kinase can be associated, therefore, with contraction and then the phosphatase with relaxation. Right? And so that's basically what this first bullet point is kind of signaling here. It's although it may appear that you know the calcium coming in and then and then the calmodulin complex being formed and the kinase activity would be responsible for the entire control of smooth muscle contraction, although that's might that might be what you first think. Um, there's also a role that the phosphatase plays in regulating calcium sensitivity. Okay? And Basically, we know that that phosphorylation is responsible for removing that phosphate group and relaxation from that myosin light chain, but neurotransmitters, hormones, and paracrine molecules are able to act on that myosin light chain phosphatase activity. And so when you think about it, let's say if you have a lot of that phosphatase, lots of those enzymes being activated and let's say that these certain neurotransmitters and hormones and and molecules are activating it you would expect more relaxation because you would have more phosphatases that are removing a phosphate group from the kinase right and so likewise if you were to have less phosphatase be active and there were less phosphatases working to begin the process of relaxation, obviously you would have less relaxation and so you would see less contraction. And this is irrelevant of how much calcium you would have in the cell at that moment. And that's why they're saying the contraction process is said to be desensitized to calcium. So regardless of calcium levels being up or down in that particular cell, if the phosphatase is working over time, you're going to have less muscle contraction. And if the phosphatase is, is really not working at all, or it's not being stimulated, I should say, then you would have more contraction, right? And so conversely, signal molecules that decrease that activity, which is what you're seeing in, in figure A over here, make the cell more sensitive to calcium. And that basically can be understood because now calcium is more relevant because we're not having all these phosphatase um, enzymes that are removing the phosphate group. And so then when calcium goes up, obviously calcium then will form that complex with calmodulin. And then we can go through the kinase pathway where we're phosphorylating the myosin light chain and then you know contraction is pursuing. So that's essentially what, what it's saying here. It's really just saying that, you know, although this is the natural pathway we go down, if you have a lot of phosphatase, then expect more relaxation. If you have less phosphatase um, being active, then expect more, more contractions. And the thing that may um, impact the activity of the phosphatase, or the three things I should say, are neurotransmitters, hormones, and paracrine molecules. Okay, so to really hone in on the points just made in the previous slide, let's take a look at this question. The contraction of smooth muscle can be attenuated even when intracellular calcium levels are high. This unique ability of smooth muscle can be attributed to variations in the activity of which of the following. So I'll give you guys a second. And the correct answer is E, myosin light chain phosphatase, as we just explained in this slide. And then just as a little summary, we're going to go through this one more time. It's a different... Um, image. This is actually from a resource called Boards and Beyond. So essentially we have our CAM, we have our calcium calmodulin complex activating this enzyme, phosphorylating the myosin light chain, and then the myosin light chain can go and then activate the ATPase and then allow actin to go and do its work. And then when the calcium is lowered, then that complex is going to dissociate from the kinase and then um, dephosphorylation will occur and we'll just have the myosin light chain by itself um, and the kinase is therefore left inactivated. So that's kind of the little 
um, push and pull between the contraction and relaxation states of myosin light chain. And then this is just one more little slide for you guys to look at once you've studied everything to go back to and if you need um, a little bit of a review of the differences between the skeletal, cardiac, and smooth muscles, you'll have that over here. So thank you guys for watching. If you guys have any questions, again, you guys can contact me in my email or number over here. Um, I hope this Pell session was somewhat helpful for you guys. And moving forward, inshallah, I hope you guys have an incredible foundation block exam and an incredible semester ahead. Um, all the best to you guys. Um, you're in my prayers and inshallah, you guys will uh, benefit from this session. So thank you again. Take care. All the best and good luck.